The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Cemetery Closing, Everything Must Go. It's an Andrew Mayhem Thriller, book number five. So we've got author Jeff Strand on the other line. How you doing, Jeff? I am also delicious. <laughs> well, we do like a guest that joins in. <laughs> yeah, we've got a tasty room here. Oh boy, so much for the COVID. Um, now, Jeff, you write about all these really happy, beautiful things. Where, where does where does your um, um, where does your mind come from? Where does where does your writing this type of book come from? Well, really, I wanted to start out writing comedies, but they were always dark comedies. So, you know, I always had kind of a sick sense of humor, and it sort of transitioned into writing horror novels with a lot of humor in them. So it's kind of just DNA, and I don't know quite where it came from, because obviously my parents did not approve of that type of sick, disgusting comedy, but it's always been there. (laughs) <laughs> did they take you for help when you were <laughs> young take you into a psychologist nope but I don't I don't think they were 100% convinced of my good sanity but hmm. well actually I like the idea I'm very cynical I'm very dark and I like the idea of having humor through darkness I think it's a good way to uh, I mean I deal with true crime and real real life events so um, the, the laughter and the and the the comedy I add to it, I think, is because of uh, just kind of a release, you know. Yep, and that's what a lot of it is. I have you know I have novels that are just goofy comedies, and then I have novels that are much more serious. And in the more serious ones, it's all comic relief. It's not you know joke after joke after joke after joke. It's lighthearted moments, you know, to give the reader a breather during the really dark stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so this is something you've been doing since the beginning, since you can remember. Have you been writing and doing this type of writing uh, way back? Or just, yeah, as long as I can remember. Now, not the horror element, but yeah, wanting to write funny stuff or just wanting to write goes back as far as I can remember, which is bad for interviews because I don't have an origin story where I say, anyway. and then on this day I realized I wanted to become a writer. It's always been there. I don't really know where it came from because there aren't really writers in my family. But, yeah, it's wow. one of those things that I've always wanted, and it was just a very, very slow progression to achieving any kind of success at it. Yeah, well, I think most writers look back at it and see it at a particular time, but I don't think it's necessarily real. It's just a way of, of just, you know, constructing it. Um, but I just wonder, so when did the horror come into the comedy? Like when, because that's, that's this particular type uh, of comedy, and you have to have a certain mindset to do this. So when did that sort of enter? Well, I was a horror fan before I started writing it, and so, you know, I would love, you know, my favorite movie as in high school was Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which is a comedy, but it's a gore-filled, you know, dark comedy. So there was that element where that was kind of in the humor that I enjoyed. But basically, I wrote, I was writing different comedy novels, but at the time, there was no, you know, comedy section of the bookstore. So you're not writing a comedy novel, you're writing a romance novel that, it's also a comedy. You're writing a mystery that's also a comedy. You're writing, you know, a, or a mainstream novel that's also a comedy. I, so I was sort of bouncing around through different genres, and then I started to write a mystery comedy, which ended up being the first Andrew Mayhem book. And it was meant to be a whodunit mystery, and technically it is a whodunit mystery, but the really dark horror elements are kind of took over. And so I finished the book. I was like, whoa, that's a lot darker than what I thought it was going to be. And then when the book came out, everyone was calling it a horror novel. And even though I, you know, I called them Andrew A.M. thrillers, it's technically a mystery, but everyone was calling it a horror novel. And at the time, it was, I had a whole bunch of novels that came out all at once. And that was the one that sort of took off. And I thought, okay, well, I can't bounce around from genre to genre with every book even though they were all comedies. So I'm going to purposely brand myself as a horror comedy writer. 
And then I did that for a long time. And then I've done some serious, quote unquote, serious horror novels along the way. And then I also, every once in a while, I completely depart from the genre. But then I always jump right back into it. Yeah. And, and how you were saying, it, there, it's always like a... Um a love with comedy or drama or murder or something with comedy. Um, do you think comedy writers are not taken as seriously in, in the literary world? Yeah, because, you know, there's, again, there's not, if you go to the comedy section of your bookstore, it's all nonfiction. There's not a humorous novels section. And so even the people who are doing, you know, the laugh out loud funny stuff, you know, David Wong, doing John Dies at the End, or this book is full of spiders, those you'll probably find in the horror section or the science fiction section, not a comedy novel. So there aren't that many authors where you can say, ah, this person writes funny novels, and that is exclusively what they're known for. They're, they tend to be lumped in with whatever other subgenre that the comedy is tied into. Wow, interesting. And, and I was going to say, how when you're writing this kind of dark comedy, um, I know I can be that way sometimes on air, and I get into trouble. I get, <laughs> and so I just wonder if this causes you um, any trouble. It causes me a lot less trouble than you would think, especially because I also have done quite a few young adult novels, and I keep, you know, there's always this fear that someone's going to, I'm going to get an angry email saying, you know, this book was completely inappropriate for my 12-year-old boy, but it really doesn't happen. And I think a lot of it is that, um, at least early on, I tended to have titles that reflected what's going on. So, you know, my latest book, Cemetery Closing, Everything Must Go, that title kind of sells the tone. You're not going to pick that book up and then say, well, I was not expecting this sort of tomfoolery. You kind of get where the book is headed. And so I haven't done anything that is really a sneak attack. I haven't done books that present themselves as something different and then you're horrified by what you discover. It's pretty much, if you look at the cover and the title and say, yes, I want to choose this as my reading material, you kind of know what you're in for. Well, I hope so, especially with the knife on it. Um, yeah. But um, so now this is this is part of a series that you have, Andrew Mayhem. So who is Andrew Mayhem? He's basically a guy, and he's grown more mature over the five books, which took twenty years to come out. But he's basically a sort of he haunted by terrible, terrible luck. He has in the first book he has a wife and two kids, and the number of children expands as the series goes along, who basically pretty much each book starts off with one very bad decision that just continues to pile up, and then by the end, the books have a lot of blood in them. Um, but I, I, I mean, so this character, where did he come from for you? Like, how did you discover um, Andrew? Like, where is he someone you knew? Is it just complete imagination, a combination of people? Complete imagination, and really the origin of the character is not what probably anyone reading the series would think. The origin of the character, like I said, it was going to be a mystery series. It wasn't going to be a horror series. To me, I thought it was just kind of funny if I did an amateur detective who has two young children, and he's, you know, the wife has a quote-unquote real job, so his job is to watch the young kids during the day, and then as he gets into these situations he's kind of stuck with his kids and that to me was the hook was that he had two kids that he has to bring along into dangerous situations and that's where a lot of the humor would come from and the kids are obviously in the whole series but i kind of moved away from that right in the second book where i said okay that's not really the hook of the character the hook of the character is that he's you know and he gets more responsible so the hook the early hook was also that he's kind of irresponsible that he takes an offer for twenty thousand dollars to you know he's approached he's at his favorite copy shop with his friend roger he gets approached by a woman who says i will give you twenty thousand dollars to dig up my husband who was buried in a shallow grave because he was accidentally buried with the key to a safety deposit box i need the key i'll pay you to go out into the woods and dig him up and that's where the first book launches 
So the inspiration for the character is he was someone who would say yes to an offer like that. And then, of course, everything goes horribly wrong. So then I kind of had fun with the later books in the series of maturing him. So the third book is all about him trying to make the right decision every time and still ending up in a nightmare situation. And the fourth book is about him and his friend Roger trying to start their own respectable business and still things go wrong. And it's kind of just a guy who really can't catch a break. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I'm just, I'm trying to capture. Okay. So, um, you know, Jeff is sitting down and he's going to be, uh, writing another, uh, book, um, with Andrew Mam, um, and so, so I'm just trying because I'm I'm a true crime nonfiction sort of guy. So I I'm sort of trying to figure out how a writer like you will take this Andrew and decide what he's going to do when a certain thing happens, how he's going to react, and and the details about him. You know who he dates, who he um, sleeps with, who he, what he eats. Um, how he behaves throughout the book and throughout the series is it, it do you, where do you draw that from is it from people you've met do you sit in a coffee shop and pick up vibes from people or is it someone you see on tv or you know it, i'm just trying to put that together how would you explain that to me being uh let's just say a non-fiction writer it's almost never oh. You know, I've written a lot of books, and I almost never pull characters from real life people. It's always, you know, I establish the basics of the character, and then try to say, okay, how would they react in this situation? So, in the case of Andrew Mayhem, because it was meant to be a you know amateur detective series, as far as the dialogue goes, I get to be a little bit more stylized. You know, some of my other books, I try to make sure the characters would say things that they would really say in a dangerous situation, but. When you're doing the private investigator subgenre, you know, the snappy one-liners are part of the whole thing. So he can have a gun pointed to his head and say something witty that I would not personally say if there was a gun to my head. If I had a gun to my head, I would be babbling incoherently. But in this book, you know, there's more of a stylized dialogue. So from there, I can, you know, he's funnier than people would be in the actual situations. And then, um, you know, He's got his wife and the kids, who he loves very much. You know, his kids get on his nerves, but he's a good father overall. So that is something, you know, his, when he's in these situations, a lot of his mindset is, you know, I want to get back to my wife and kids. So he's not really into making, you know, insane decisions. You know, he's not really that much into risking his life. He's not a cowardly character, but he's not a overly heroic character because you know he's got a family to take care of so a lot of his decisions are filtered through that and a lot of his decisions are filtered through not getting in trouble when he gets back so he will make the horrible decision of you know accepting the twenty thousand dollars when that turns out completely different from what he expected then a lot of his future decisions are based on okay well i didn't get the twenty thousand dollars i need to you know not get screamed at by my wife when i get home so fear of his wife is also another lens through which he views the world. Listening to you speak, Jeff, it, it, it's, um, I suppose as you hear an author talk about his characters, you start to have your own perception and, and form that perception of them yourself. I mean, I haven't had the fortune to read the book. So um, I'm, as you're describing, I'm kind of seeing some sort of Jim Carrey character play out. But is there... Um, is there a part of you in the character, do you think? Is there, or is there a character that you would quite like to be in your books? There's not much Andrew Mayhem in me. Andrew Mayhem is kind of the opposite because it took me a long time to become a full-time writer. And during that time, I had a responsible desk job. So I was always, you know, I need to have insurance. I need to have a, you know, nine-to-five job to deposits money into my account every two mm-hmm. weeks so i was always all about that whereas andrew mayhem isn't he's he would be the guy who quit his day job 10 years before i did trying to become a full-time writer so he's not that much and the dialogue isn't the way i talk and so there's really he's a fun character to write but you're not going to see much of him in me i have a novel one of my non-horror novels is called kumquat and that's basically a romantic road trip comedy. And that one, the character himself is not like me because he's, you know, 
unsure and neurotic, and I'm not really neurotic at all, but um, I pulled a lot. For that one specifically, I said, you know what, I'm going to pull some events from my life, but it's filtered through a fictional narrator. So, you know, there aren't that many. You know, if I were going to, if it was which character would you want to be, I think apart from all the danger they're in, I think it would be fun to be uh, George and Lou from my Wolf Hunt series because they, you know, they're snappy dialogue. They have fun criminal jobs and stuff, but, you know, they're not at all based on me and they have a lot of werewolf problems to deal with, so that wouldn't be that much fun. But when, when we think about different characters, there's some, there is some escapism, isn't there? So I guess what I was um, getting at is that are there some parts of your characters that you'd quite like to be? I kind of like uh, the hero of my book, Blister, who is, it takes place in the 80s, so he's an extremely successful newspaper cartoonist. And that's some like fantasy fulfillment for me because growing up, I while I was writing, I really wanted to be a cartoonist, but I can't draw, so that dream didn't ever come to fruition so that there's an element of wish fulfillment there where it's like yeah i would like his life in the 80s but aside from that my characters you know my structure tends to be um bad things happen early on and then continue to happen until the book is over so you know i don't write harry potter stuff where you think oh i would love to go to the magical school of hogwarts <laughs> it tends to be wow this guy had 300 pages of really bad stuff happening and got out at the end but man i don't want to be him so there's not aside from the fact that my characters say things off the cuff that took me a while to think of for them to say you know i would like to have the mm -hmm. level of wit where everything was written and edited and proofread before i said it instead of oh man i wish i had Half an hour ago, I really would have told that person off. So aside from the dialogue, there's not really anything where I say, yo, I would like to be that character because I tend to write about really bad, scary things happening and my characters get hurt a lot. So there's, it's very how rare you, that I... How your characters deal with things, their values, their, their ethics, their thought processes, some of those things might be quite desirable. Yeah, well, a lot of it is I've never been in the situations that my characters are in. So, yeah, I don't tend to have characters who, you know, my hero is not someone who's going to run off and leave his friend to die. So they tend to be, mm. they tend to step up when things get really bad. And it's one of those, you know, I would like to think that that's how I would behave. I would like to think that if a serial killer was in the house with an axe that I would not tell my wife, sorry, got to go and flee out the front door. But. You don't push her in front of the killer and run? <laughs> I would like to think that in that situation... He's not sure, but he'd like to think. <laughs> I would like to think that in that situation I would not do that, but I have not actually been in that situation. So, what well, a diplomatic answer. <laughs> well, so, it depends on how much insurance you have on her. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's, you know, I try to do, you know, because you're supposed to be rooting for the heroes, I don't write characters who you're supposed to hope for them to die. So they tend to, you know, retain their ethics when the things get bad. But as far as, you know, I like to think that I'm already like that, not I aspire to be like that, but luckily I haven't had that tested. So we'll okay. see. I'll, well, we're, we're I will I will do a follow-up review if I find myself in a life or death situation. No, I just completely chickened out. I fled. Well, it was we'll, bad. we'll get that set up. Don't worry. Yeah. Right. Um, now, so are your your characters very personal to you? Are they like children? They are children that I treat horribly. <laughs> well, no, it's fun to you know. I when I return to them, most of my books are standalones, but I've got the Andrew Mayhem series, and then I've got the George and Lou series, which is Wolf Hunt. So it's fun to return to them, but I don't have the you know. Some writers will say my characters talk to me my characters tell me what they're doing it's like no i tell them what they're doing you know i i don't you know i'm really focused on the technical aspects and i don't have that element where you know they speak to me in my dreams and stuff it's kind of their characters in a book and i make awful stuff happen to them and i work hard to make sure that they're relatable and that the reader roots for them but i don't treat them like my kids because i 
that would just be child abuse. Well, <laughs> there you go. Welcome to the country. I um, well, that's 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 pretty cool. But uh, when you write these books, of course, there's the story in the book. But is there an underlying theme or idea that you want readers to take home with them after they've read your book? We kind of have covered it. It's kind of just stepping up when things get bad. And that's not ever, I'm going to write a novel that discusses the idea of stepping up when things get bad. But it's kind of the ongoing, you know, be your best self when things have fallen apart. As far as other thematic stuff, not I, it's not a conscious type thing. It comes out throughout the books. But I never, you know, I when I sit down to write a book, I'm thinking of, you know, the premise and how the story is going to develop and who the characters are going to be. But I'm not generally saying, okay, and here's the message I wish to convey to my readers through that. That tends to just sort of happen organically as I write, but it's not a conscious thing at the beginning. Mm. So uh, what do you suggest for a um, a brand-new writer, someone writing horror or uh, something like this, um, and and they haven't been published yet? What is your key thing to tell them? Um. In 2020, I think the key thing is don't be afraid of practice novels. I've been doing this for a long time. So when I started, you had to do practice novels. Unless you were a genius and your first novel was really good publishable, you had to write a bad book and then progressively less bad ones until you learned to write publishable stuff. Now you can self-publish whenever you want. So if I, you know, if I finish my first book, I can have it available for the world to read in 12 hours and so it's important to understand that it's okay if you finish your first novel you've done it you've written 300 pages you've typed the end and it's not that good that's totally fine you write another one that is better until you learn to write so overall just don't be afraid of the practice novel that is part of the process a lot of very few writers of my generation ever published their first book they wrote a few books before they wrote something that was good enough to publish. Hmm. So who, what are your influences in, in, the, in, in, in writing and in even movies or whatever? What influences you in the, in the horror comedy writing? Well, when I started, it was more um, the comedy side. So like the first time I read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe you're allowed to do that. I read... You know, there was silly humor in magazines that I liked growing up. You know, I really liked uh, Dynamite Magazine and Bananas Magazine. So a lot of the humorous stuff I read came from there. But I had never read a book that was just allowed to be that silly. I didn't think that was even allowed. I thought that you can't write an actual novel and sell it and have people read it when it's that ridiculous. So that sort of changed everything. It's like, wow, I can actually write the kind of stuff I write and maybe someday it will get published. And so it came from there. And then probably the closest influence in terms of writing style would be Dave Barry. And not his fiction, his nonfiction, but, you know, his comedy essays were, you know, the funniest stuff I had ever read. So that elements of that found their way into my writing while I was developing my style. In terms of horror, now I started with The Usual Suspects. I started reading Stephen King and I started reading Dean Koontz. I don't know that I would consider them influences because I, you know, when I first discovered Stephen King, I had to read everything he published and the same thing with Dean Koontz, but I don't know if there was any conscious influence. The more conscious influence was a lesser known writer, especially while he was alive. Now that he's not, he's grown a lot more um, in popularity, but Richard Lehman, because you know, he very little description, just kind of get to the point, completely unpretentious. And I never liked a lot of description. Like, if you said, what does Andrew Mayhem look like? I could tell you his age and just very mild, but, you know, I don't have a fully formed picture. And that, when I read Richard Lane, I was like, wow, you're allowed to do that. You can skip all the description and just, here's what happened. So that that ended up being an influence because, wow, you're allowed to do that. That's great. That's, that's kind of how I like to write. Now, out of, out of all the work you've done, how many books have you written now? We're up to about 50 at this point. 
Wow. Um, is, is there a favorite book or favorite story that you've written that you keep coming back to that you still love? I don't actually go back to any of them unless it's like working on a screenplay adaptation or something. Because then once it's done, I'm done with it. I don't. I never say, "Gosh, let me pull one of my old books off the shelf and enjoy that." So it's basically all based on memories of them. Because once I'm done with the proofreading process, where I've read it 50 times, I don't need to see it again. But my favorite of all my books is, um, and I keep. I have two that are in the top spot, so I will go with Blister for this one, which is basically a book about a cartoonist, a extremely successful cartoonist who has these kids who are throwing rocks at his dog, so he tries to scare the kids, but accidentally, while he's chasing them down the sidewalk, one of them breaks their arm, and his agent says, this is bad PR, you need to just go out to my cabin and lay low for a couple weeks. And then while he's there, he meets this hideously disfigured woman who lives in a shed outside of her dad's house and then it becomes kind of a really weird mystery horror comedy love story it's got lots of different elements in it that i think for this particular book i think i pulled them together pretty well so that's my favorite of them and and um so how now how hmm, where do i want to go here how do you decide when you're going to write a new character and a new series? Um, I haven't started a new series in quite a while. What happened? Andrew Mayhem was specifically designed as a series. You know, it was Pride Investigator. At the time, I thought, hey, I'm just going to be doing Andrew Mayhem books for the rest of my career. So I would have thought that I would be up to book 50 or so by now. And then I kind of the first three came out really quick, and then it was a long, you know, I think it was ten years before the next one, and then it was several more years before the fifth one. And the fifth one might close it out. It doesn't definitively end it, but that may be it for the Andrew Mayhem series. With Wolf Hunt, it was really, it was written for a publisher called Leisure, who's no longer in business, but at the time they were the horror place. And they didn't do series. So Wolf Hunt was not written as a series, but I was enjoying writing it so much. I was like, man, I love these guys. I would definitely bring them back. And so later, once I got the rights back, I brought them back for Wolf Hunt 2 and Wolf Hunt 3. But that wasn't originally intended as a series. It was just I enjoyed the main characters so much, and there was no reason they couldn't come back. So I did that. So I've done one that was conceived as a series and one that was accidentally a series. I get a lot of requests for sequels to various books, but I'm almost always more interested in a standalone. So, you know, one of my more recent books is called Allison. I get lots of people saying, oh, when are you going to bring Allison back? And I don't know. Maybe at some point, but right now I'm focused entirely on new stuff. So I get much more excited about a brand new standalone with new characters than I do about returning to the older stuff. Jeff, if you could cast somebody to play Andrew Mayhem in a film, what would your so top three actors be that would audition? Weirdly, my response is always, I don't know. It's like I don't have the ability to cast actors in my mind, and so whenever the question comes up, I like I can never come up with it. It's like I would be a terrible casting director because I don't ever think of them as actors which is kind of weird because I have a cinematic writing style and I kind of visualize it as a movie as I'm writing but not a movie where I've cast any of the characters so it's always you know someone will say well why doesn't this character play you know put Bruce Campbell as Andrew Mayhem I think oh that's a great idea but that's not anything I would have come up on my own you know Billy Crudup like someone else suggested that and I thought oh yeah that would be great but you know it's it's never something where I, you know, have pictures of the actors, you know, taped to my monitor while I'm writing or anything like that. I usually have no idea. It's like you don't have Brad Pitt taped to your. <laughs> no. Nope. Um, you know, I've I've got movie stuff going on, and people will throw. You know, they'll say, "Oh, we're going to reach out to this person." And I'm like, "Oh, that's a great idea. I didn't think of that at all." But 
there's no one that I had thought of. There's no one where I can say, here's who I think would be the perfect casting. It's always kind of a surprise when someone else mentions it, because for whatever reason, my brain doesn't work in terms of what famous actors would play these characters. Yeah, yeah. Caitlyn Jenner. Absolutely. Well, how it, so what makes a good horror to you? I think it's identification with the characters so that you want them to get out of it, whether they do or not. You know, it should be, for me, you know, I want you to read these books not thinking, oh, man, when is this person going to die? I want you to think, how is this person going to escape? So, you know, my book Ferocious is about zombie animals in the woods. It's the whole forest. Every animal has, the animals have died and come back to life, and they're thirsty for human blood. But the focus is on the two people who are trapped in a cabin. It's this guy Rusty and his niece Smear. And so that was the initial focus is how do I get you to really, really be rooting for these two? And then it's 250 pages of them being attacked by zombie animals with you hoping they get out. And I think without the setup of trying to get you to like them, then it's nowhere near as interesting of a book. So for me, successful horror is always hoping the horror doesn't start. It's always where, you know, you don't want them, you don't want the book to end with Rusty and Mia getting eaten by a zombie bear. You want the book to end with them escaping the zombie bear. Hmm. Now, so is there anybody you'd like to work with? Any any horror people or writers or anybody that you'd like to work with? Generally, only in the case of adding their sales to mine. So, yeah, I would work with Stephen King in a heartbeat. I'm, when I'm a collaborator, I, you know, I, when I have collaborated, it's been with people who are way more successful than me, so I don't get to be bossy, even though I like to be a control freak. So, like, I wrote a book with uh, James A. Moore called The Haunted Forest Tour, and then I did a collaboration, which was four of us, with uh, J. A. Conrath, F. Paul Wilson, and Blake Crouch, who were all, you know, way more successful than me. And, of course, Blake Crouch has become a New York Times bestseller since the book Dracula's that we wrote together. And I was a low man on the, you know, I was the least successful author in that, so I had, you know, I had my 20% say, but I prefer a situation where I can boss the co-author around and say, hey, I am Jeff Strand. We will make the decisions based on my great success and expertise. So, but no, there isn't really anyone, you know, I love Christopher Moore's work. I love David Wong's work. I don't know what a collaboration would bring to it. It would kind of be more me putting my goofy humor in someone more serious. So, I don't know, maybe a very literate Peter Straub could benefit from my stupidity inflicted upon his books. But for the most part, I just don't really say, oh, I would love to collaborate with that person, except for the fact that I'd be a millionaire if I collaborated with Stephen King. <laughs> uh, so so are, what, what's next for you after this? Are you, are you going to continue writing horror comedy, kind of that, style for quite a while or? yeah that's you know i'll probably make the occasional detour like i've been doing but no there are no plans to abandon it right now my next book is called um autumn bleeds into winter which is a coming of age thriller which um takes place in fairbanks alaska in 1979 and it's about a 14 year old boy whose best friend was abducted and he saw the abduction he knows who did it but he can't get anyone to um, believe him and so the book opens with him basically confronting the guy at gunpoint and saying I know what you did give me the evidence so I can put you away wow. and it's based on you know horror fans love those coming of age stories the stuff like something wicked this way comes boys life by Robert McCammon a lot of those so it's kind of I wanted to put my own imprint on the coming of age horror subgenre. Yeah. Do you, do you like the uh like the T V horror, the movies and stuff of, of today and, and of recent, you know, in the last ten, fifteen, twenty years even? Or as compared to something from the sixties? I like every era of horror. You know, I grew up in the eighties, so 
know, if there's an 80s horror movie, there's a 90% chance that I've seen it. So that was when I was, you know, watching everything that came out. That's when I would go to the video store every single weekend and whatever new releases were there, I would watch. I'm not as tuned in as I am now, but I think in terms of just movie for movie, I think we're in one of the best ages ever for horror films. You know, there's stuff like Hereditary and Midsummer that's just phenomenal. And I think there's a lot of really, really good horror horror movies coming out now i don't watch the tv shows as much when i watch tv it tends i don't watch that much tv anyway so a show you know when i discovered justified well that was the next four months of my tv viewing to catch up on that and i i'm not as horror focused i when i watch movies i tend to watch mostly horror when i watch tv it's not as focused so i've never seen american horror story and a lot of that stuff i am watching lovecraft country right now so that's hmm. excellent but a lot of the current horror stuff you know i do watch the walking dead and i keep falling in and out of love with that one but um <laughs> i'm not i don't watch that much horror tv although so, the stuff i watch is really good but as far as movies go we are in a golden age there's a lot of really really good intelligent stuff coming out you know but when something like the um walking dead comes on and becomes a big hit it really opens it up for horror but did you feel that that really um because that came from a comic book right right Uh, does it really transfer into shows like that good I think it can. You know, Walking Dead is a show that it it has moments of you know greatness, and then they screw it up. So it's like I'll I will say, oh, I'm back into the Walking Dead. I'm all in. I love the show again, and then it will turn to crap again. So it's I don't know. The Walking Dead is probably not the best example, just because the quality is so wildly uneven on the show. Mm-hmm. Although the zombie stuff is always incredible, I could never have imagined you would get a show that had, you know, as good of zombie action as that show has. It's more the overall story where they mess up a lot. But um, I don't, there's no reason it can't translate. You know, the idea of, well, in a horror story, you have to worry that your character is going to get killed. Well, the show has had pretty much not a 100% turnover, but pretty close in its main cast. So pretty much no one who was in the show the first season is still on it because they just they are pretty merciless. But I don't know that you necessarily need to kill off your characters for the show to be successful. You know, the Andrew Mayhem series, it's only five books, but they're all first person. So you know, you know, on page one that he's still going to be alive at the end. And I don't think it impacts that much. I don't think you need to, you know, unlike, like any other genre, I don't think you have, you know, it's fine if you know that um, Indiana Jones is not going to die during his adventures. I think it, you're able to still go along with the story. So I think there's no reason serialized horror can't work. I think it's, now I haven't seen American Horror Story, but I think that the fact that they reboot every season is probably a good thing where you, you're not committed to, eight different seasons following the same characters you're committed to one season and they just sort of start over at the end of each season so i think that's probably the way to go but yeah yeah, there's no reason that you can't have great horror tv right um okay now do you have a website or a place that people can go and find out more about you yes www.jeffstrand.com oh that's a hard one okay um we're gonna have that as well as your book your newest book up on our website so people listening can do one click and and find you and uh wow really appreciate you uh, taking the time hey does does this do you find that um i ask this of a lot you know the whole covid and all of the things going on in 2020 does that change your writing especially because you're kind of a horror comedy and 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 so much could be built around a pandemic and and the falling of an empire or like the u.s or something no i actually i'm a member of the horror writers association atlanta chapter and we have an agent and at our first virtual meeting because now our real meetings have been canceled 
but at our virtual meeting, she said, you know, don't write pandemic stuff. I'm already getting flooded with it. So I figure, you know, if every other author is thinking, hey, this is the time to do pandemic, that's where I need to not be writing. And it, it's weird because I'll be writing stuff thinking, you know, these characters aren't properly social distancing, but I don't know where the world is going to be. You don't want to write stuff that looks, you know, unless I'm specifically setting it in 2020, I don't know where we're going to be in 2021. I don't know if movie theaters are ever going to, you know, completely reopen. You know, in maybe a year from now, I can just go on down to a restaurant like nothing is changed or it could be that you know you never get to really go to a restaurant without a mask and i don't know how any of this works i pretty much have just been taking the policy of ignoring it for now just pretending it doesn't happen until the world has stabilized and we know actually what's going to happen because i'm not yeah. good at predicting the future so i don't want stuff to seem you know I don't want a book that five years from now feels weird where it's like wait that oh, oh we know when he wrote that because the characters are staying six feet apart at all times, and yeah, that's yeah, over very now. dated. Yeah, well, but but I wonder, but um, when when there's a dark time like that, and Black Lives Matter, and and the country, and everything, all the protests, everything going on, or if there's ever a darkness within your own circle, there, um, does that affect the way you write? Do do you do you get darker within your own writing? No, I think I actually get lighter. I think, um, you know, my book, Allison, which weirdly is about a woman, she's got telekinetic powers and she basically lives by herself and can't go around anyone. So it's, it's a weird social distancing book that was written and it, it was written before COVID-19 and it was published basically the same week that uh, stay at home orders became a thing. Right. And it's kind of weird because it's, basically all about so about a woman who is forced to social distance, but it was written before any of this happened. But then after that, everything that was written, you know, Cemetery Closing Everything Must Go was written entirely during COVID, and it was kind of consciously lighter because I figure, you know, when the world is miserable, you know, horror can thrive in really dark times, but I kind of wanted to do something more entertaining. So this book is just, you know, pure fun. And Autumn Bleeds into Winter, even though it's about a child abduction, it's a much more entertaining book. It's not dark. It's not, it's dark, but it's not nihilistic. It's not, you know, a grueling read where you can barely turn the page. It, it's, it's more of the fun suspense type stuff. So it's kind of, you know, I don't know that there's not a significant difference in that you're not going to go through my list of books and say, ah, that one was clearly written during COVID-19 because it's so much lighter. It's not to that extreme, but I do find myself more interested in the fun suspense, fun horror than I am in, you know, the really, really intense nightmarish stuff. Yeah, no, it's just interesting to see how uh, these sort of things um, affect or change a writer in, in, in yeah. how, and how they're writing or how they're feeling and and if if it gets somehow bled into what they write, you know. Um, yeah, so. it's one of those, I'm disturbed every day when I turn on the news, so I'm <laughs> trying to be more entertaining in my you know, my fiction, not necessarily a break from it, because I would be writing lighthearted romantic comedies if it was meant to be a full counter-programming, but I am purposely kind of lightening up a little bit. Yeah, so in, in a way it's a little bit more of a... Of a, of a it's something, escape is yeah, it's yeah. escape, kind of to get away and stuff. So, well, that's amazing. So, um, well, this has been very interesting, and um, I'm glad you took the time and uh, give us a little insight on your writing and and horror comedy and all of that. And I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. This was great. Okay, our guest has been Jeff Strand. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. 
I'll be back.